Well, good morning, church family. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Guys, we have the awesome honor and privilege to take the Lord's Supper this morning. So hopefully uh, you grabbed uh, some elements as you came in. If you did not, if you would please lift your hand, because at this moment the uh, uh, deacons will be, will be coming through the aisles and just being able to make sure you have these. Let me say up front, if you are a born-again believer, if you know that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, we invite you, we welcome you to take the Lord's Supper with us. Um, but, if, but if you are still just searching through Christianity, if you're trying to figure these things out, uh, we are really glad that you are here. We're really honored. Uh, you are welcome. Uh, but these elements are reserved for those who have been born again, okay? And so our entire service is going to be moving towards that moment. So, so believer, begin to prepare your heart and your mind uh, to take the Lord's Supper because we never want to take it in an unworthy manner. Every year, I'm reminded of the magnificent humility of God in the nativity story. The only ones, okay, invited to celebrate the birth of the Son of God were shepherds, right? A host, a heavenly host comes and gives a personal invitation to lowly forgotten shepherds out in the field. Luke 2, verse 9, and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for you and for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Good news of great joy, joy to the world. You know, this time of year, right, we see the word joy a lot as you're going through stores and Hobby Lobby or at, uh, different people's houses. The, that word joy is that we sing the word joy an awful lot. Okay? The question is, though, if we're honest, do we believe that message that I bring you good news of great joy? Joy, a wellspring of life that overflows with delight and pleasure. And is joy our experienced reality as Christians? Charles Spurgeon has a famous quote that says, the thought of delight in religion is so strange to most men. Yet as one commentator reminds us, although the New Testament centers on the cross, its note from beginning to end is one of triumphant joy. It begins with an angel's chorus and ends with rejoicing around the throne. So would your life be characterized by joy? Now, in fairness, right? Say, pastor, that's completely unfair, okay? Our struggles with joy are because we are dependent beings, right? Our delight is contained in a bucket that has holes in the bottom. Think with me how easy it is that joy dissipates in your life. We get sick we have aches and pains. Our strength runs out and we tire. We get overwhelmed by circumstances. And that feeling of joy has all but vanished. There's a weight and a responsibility for being a good spouse, for being a parent, right? Uh, to, to provide, to perform at work. And that comes with it all sorts of baggage, of worry. And if you're anything like me, our minds race to all that could go wrong, right? My, my joy leaks out of my bucket because I borrow tomorrow's worries. 
A anyone here with me? I mean, I haven't even spoken about how difficult relationships are and, and that when they are broken, they too steal our joy. Can I confess something to you this morning as your pastor? That as I have meditated on this word, being prepared, right? I have to prepare myself to be able to preach to you. As I've meditated all week, even as a Christian, what I realize is that I struggle allowing myself what I call unfiltered joy. I've noticed that my heart it filters joy. It holds it back. Now, I share, with you, I share this with you because maybe I'm not alone. And so I asked myself this week, why do I do that? Now, there are a few reasons for that, and I don't have time to share all of it. Let me just say this quickly, that I see a lot of our culture in myself. You see, bad news sells in our culture. We like to stack up problems and, and ways that we have been victimized gives one clout. And as I've been praying about my own heart this week, why my heart restrains joy, honestly, much of that culture is in me. But I also have to tell you the chief number one reason for why my heart filters, holds back how much joy I allow myself to experience is because my heart is always asking the question, is God truly pleased with me? Does he want me to be joyful? Or is his disposition towards me one of disappointment? Friend, if that is you this morning, I'm so glad you're here because Hebrews 12 has something magnificent to say to us this morning. Listen as I read Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Our heavenly Father, God, as, as we have come to your word this morning, and as we have asked serious, legitimate questions of our heart, we invite you to examine us. Examine us, Father. Expose the lies we believe, and the reasons that we do not find you as our ultimate source of joy. And Father, this morning, teach us, teach us to abide in you and to find you that overflowing well that springs forth life and joy to our eternal delight. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so this morning, we are gonna focus on verse two there, okay? Verse two of Hebrews 12, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, okay? The author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We're gonna focus on that. It is worth our attention. It will stir up your affection, okay? And then we will come back and we will set it in its context and we will apply it to our lives. But hear me, your heart needs to hear verse two, all that is there for you. Now, obviously, I hope you've noticed that the, 
the uh, stage that looks a little different this morning. There are, there are three props, and this signifies three movements of the sermon. Uh, this is the throne. Apparently, this is the, the most ornate chair that we have in the church, all right? So this is, this is Christ's throne in heaven. First scene, we'll walk through this. As he moved to the cross, but then the third scene is joy. Joy, because that's where Hebrews 12 points us this morning. Okay? So, consider with me how perfect and utmost joy Jesus was in eternity past. Completely, you and I need to be reminded of this because, because of our own leaky bucket, but the reality is the scripture says that, that God is self-sufficient. He is self-sustaining. He lacks nothing. He has complete and utter happiness and joy in and of himself. He doesn't have a leaky bucket, okay? Circumstances cannot steal anything from him. He doesn't need naps, okay? He doesn't get hungry or hangry like you and I. He is utterly sufficient. He wasn't lonely in eternity. He did not create us because he had a hole in his heart that he needed to fill like he was desperate for a friend or companionship. The scripture says he lacked nothing because he does all that he pleases, all of it, completely sufficient. And enough, this is very important for you to understand. Look at this verse, Psalm 16, 11. In your presence, that's God's presence, is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Meditate on that. What it is like to be in God's presence. Fullness of joy. That he is the source of all joy. The source of all joy. And then scripture tells us that he left his heavenly throne to go to a cradle in the dirt to become a helpless babe nursing on his mother's milk hunted by an evil King Herod celebrated only by the shepherds all in a march towards the cross. Sent by the Father, the Son in complete obedience marched towards the cross. And the question you and I must ask this morning is why? Now to answer that question biblically, there, there are a number of ways that we could answer that, okay? Uh, 1 John 3.8 tells us that he came to destroy the works of the devil. Luke 19.10 tells us that he came to seek and to save the lost. And John 12.28 says that he came to glorify the name of the Father. So all of those are biblical ways to answer the question, why is it that Christ left the throne of heaven became incarnate and moved towards the cross. But this morning, what does Hebrews 12, 2 say? It says that there was a joy that was on the other side of the cross that he fixed his eyes towards a joy that he was pursuing. Now, I need you to notice this, okay? Who, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Guys, notice that there is also a throne on the other side. You see that in the text? There's a throne on the other side. Okay? So it's a leaving of the throne and a returning to the throne, but now with added joy. Remember, the son was completely joyful, self-sufficient, lacking nothing. So what is the added joy, delight, pleasure that overshadowed the cross? Church, I would like to propose to you this morning that we should view that joy as two things. One, God's delight to save us by his mercy. That God would rather be glorified by his grace against his wrath. He would rather be glorified by his grace. And that that there is a joy in the glory of God on display with his mercy on the cross. That God has a joy in displaying his mercy. There are many passages that share this sentiment. Let me share with you Zephaniah three seventeen, because it looks forward to the cross, and in it it says, "He will exalt over you with joy. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy." That God delights in saving us. He does not delight in the dying of man, but he rejoices to make us his own. And so the first joy, as we see it, is, is that God's joy in saving us, that, that he delighted to be glorified by mercy. And the second one is his joy given to us. John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. All right, so when when you and I think of Christ leaving his throne in heaven and enduring and going to the cross, it, it is because there was a joy that he wanted to give us that he longed for the day that he could gift to us his joy, a fullness of joy, a wellspring of joy that one day will never end. All right, so with those two joys in mind, his joy and delight in displaying his grace and saving us and His gift of joy to us. His joy in us. Guys, the author of Hebrews invites us to consider the price that was paid on the cross in order to gain that joy. As a kid, I used to collect baseball cards. Any of you guys collect baseball cards? I would love to go to the baseball card shop, buy packs of cards, and you would, you would search through. You're always hoping to find that, that one really valuable card. And then there's this real oddity with baseball cards. That is if you find an error card, a card that's accidentally messed up, like it's worth a whole lot more. So I'd get these baseball cards, and I'd be like, Dad, I found this error card. It's worth like $15. My dad always had this particular saying when I would say something like this. He would say, Son, it is only worth what someone is willing to pay you for it. Now, guys, that's an important truth. Because the worth of an object is displayed by the cost that one is willing to pay in order to gain it. When lovers are separated by war... And their love withstands the test of time and difficult circumstances. As the movie closes, we marvel at the high value of love displayed. Their love was was stronger than the pain that was afflicted to the POW. 
And, and, and their love sustained her, right? When loneliness told her to give up hope. You see, cost and hardship shows the value of their love. Consider the cross of Christ and the cost incurred for the joy set before him. Amen. Consider the physical pain as the blood rolled down his brow. As his hands and feet were nailed to the cross. As his back was scourged and torn to shreds. As his shoulders and wrists and elbows were dislocated on the cross. As he knew inevitably that he would suffocate to death and his chest was gasping for every breath. Consider the pain of the cross. Because in that pain, Jesus saw joy. Consider the shame of the cross. As they mock him, put a crown of thorns and a purple robe around him and spit in his face. As they cry out for Barabbas, a known murderer to be set free and yell out, crucify to him. As they strip him naked and jeer and laugh as they cast lots for his clothes. As they mock him on the cross, saying he saved others. I wonder if he can save himself. Consider the shame of the cross. And the fact that Jesus saw joy. Consider that he was forsaken by the Father. See him kneeling in the garden, sweating blood, asking if there is any other way. And the father responds with silence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whatever took place in the Trinity itself, as he became our curse of sin and the Father turned his face away, nailing my certificate of debt on the cross, consider being forsaken by the Father and know that through it all, Christ looked forward to joy. Through his pain, through his shame, over against even the forsaking of the Father, that Christ considered the joy 
that he would give to you and I on the other side the joy of saving us and calling us his own by his mercy and the joy of being our source, our fountain of joy. He considered that greater than all that he endured. So remember where we started with the questions of my heart. Is God truly pleased with me? Or is his disposition towards me one of disappointment? Beloved, hear me. If this morning you are in Christ, listen, God is entirely completely satisfied with the payment of his son for your sin. That it was the joy of being able to call you his own. The joy of being able to rejoice over you with mercy that Christ looked to. That is what Christ was longing for. Listen, he is not mad at you. Do you hear me? He is not mad at you. That his wrath is forever removed from you because you are his own. Dane Ortland has a great illustration in the book Gentle and Lowly about a medical doctor who traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe that has been afflicted by a deadly disease. The doctor has spent his entire life savings, okay, developing a cure, flying his medical equipment over there, and he's traveled deep into the jungle to do it so that he could provide this life-saving treatment and make it available. But as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted refuse. They are prideful and suspicious. They are hesitant. They would rather heal on their own terms. Finally, a few brave young men step forward and receive the free, life-saving care. Now, let me ask you, in this moment, once, once those young men have finally, in this moment, what does the doctor feel? Joy, right? Joy. And his joy is dependent on the more that come forward and receive his life-saving measures, right? The more that you trust him, the more he is filled with joy. Beloved, right? Why? Because that's the reason he came. Beloved, Jesus calls us his own. Listen, he does not get frustrated or flustered when we come to him for fresh forgiveness, for renewed pardon, With our emptiness, it is the reason he came. It is his joy to have mercy upon us. But what about this question? Does he really want us to have unfiltered joy? Or does Jesus say, yeah, listen, I saved you. Okay, but I'm still reserved, right? I'm limiting the amount of joy that I even want to give you. As Christians, does does Jesus want us to be the happiest of all people? Yes. Yes, a thousand times, yes. Psalm 37, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Listen, every other joy in life is fading. I know we are dependent beings, all right? But he is our source of joy. Right, And as he stood here at the cross, what did he look forward? He looked forward to being our source of joy. 
He could not wait. He longed to give that to us. Oh, friend, do you see it? Does your heart see it? Do you drink that in this morning? All right. I'm a little excited, all right? I hope you are too. All right, so let's, let's quickly... Let us share the context of this verse and let's, let's ask the application for each of us this Christmas. So when this, when this letter of Hebrews is, is written to the church, they are enduring much suffering. They've been publicly shamed, imprisoned. They've even had their property stolen and plundered from them. You can read about this in, in Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. You can get that whole context, right? They've endured a lot of suffering. And so the author in, in chapter 11, he, he encourages them by reminding them there's a great cloud of witnesses, saints who's gone before you, okay? Okay. And they are crying out to them and to us, keep pressing on. Don't quit, all right? We have overcome great obstacles, and so can you. So, so chapter 12, verse 1, right? Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also, guys, let us lay aside every uh, encumbrance and, and let the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, okay? Be because faith, the life of faith is a marathon. Yes, life is hard. And we get discouraged. We have a leaky bucket, but we can persevere, and don't get sucked back into the sin and the cycle of sin that so easily entangles us, and that is part of this world. Instead, what are we to do? Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. You see, the way that Jesus fixed his eyes on the joy that would be ours, you and I are called to see that he now sits in heaven, enthroned, but now he has the joy. And you and I are to see that, and we are to fix our eyes on that. So that whatever circumstance we go through, right, we do not quit. We keep persevering because we see that he is our source of joy, right? Not as the world searches for joy. The world says that if I am comfortable, if I am secure, if I have the right things and none of the bad circumstances, then I will have joy. But guys, that's fleeting. It's rubbish, I mean, haven't you lived long enough to know that it's like chasing after the wind? But fixing our eyes on him and the joy that he has preserved for us, that in his presence, okay, is fullness of joy. And no matter what circumstance you're in, he offers you his presence, doesn't he? All right, in him who exalts over saving you and him who came to give us life, abundant life filled with joy. It is by fixing our eyes on that that we overcome. These are the instructions. This is the application. Wherever you are, be like Jesus and fix your eyes the way he did. One of C.S. Lewis's most famous quotes, he charges us that our desire for joy and pleasure is not too great, but rather it's too small because we are too easily satisfied. Listen to what he says. He said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, 
but like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a vacation at the sea. Oh, that you and I would cry out with the psalmist this morning in Psalm 43. He says, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me, God. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. And then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. To God, my exceeding joy. So if you would, if you would begin to take the elements and begin to prepare them. Take the bread, prepare the bread. And as a born again believer, right, we we never want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And this morning, as we have considered as we have considered the cross and the price that he paid, the price that he paid on the cross and why he did it, would you spend a few moments and would you just confess? Do not take your sin lightly, but leave it at the cross. Do that for just a moment, and then we will take this together as a family. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body. Now, as you prepare the cup, I want you to think about the joy of your Savior. I want you to think about his delight to save you by his mercy. That that is his glory. That is his own joy and delight. And that the moment by faith you come to the cross, you confess, you remember. He says it's paid for. Enter into my joy. You think about that right now. You don't dare take this cup in an unworthy manner because his desire is for you to be filled with joy. taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Our heavenly father, we praise you this morning. King Jesus, we praise you 
that you endured the pain and the shame and the suffering of the cross for our joy, that you would rather be glorified by your mercy and pour it out over us. Father, we, we confess we are finite beings. We have a leaky bucket. But God, help us to find you as our source of joy, our wellspring of life. Forgive us whenever we search after the, the same measly things of this world, particularly at Christmas time. God, we can get so distracted. But you are our joy. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes up and leads us in a final song, it is an invitation for you to respond. In fact, the truth is you, you are commanded to respond because you've heard God's word. Okay, I can never tell you what that looks like, but we will have ministers down here at the front who would love to to pray with you, to be uh, just someone who, who walks along and, and shares the burden if, if there's a heaviness of your heart this morning. If you want to use these steps or this stage as an altar to pour out your heart to the Lord, if it's excitement, if it's joy, whatever it is, I pray that there's a freedom that you can respond however the Spirit has prompted you. Okay? If you've never Ask Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Right? He left his throne because there is a joy that he wants to give you. Come. I would delight in nothing more than to be able to share with you how you too can be a Christian, can be born again, and know Jesus Christ personally. Whatever decision God has placed upon your heart, you be obedient.